I'm sorry for the term. Yeah. Um, yes, basically that. <laughs> um, I would like to introduce myself very shortly. Um, I'm Florencia Malamu. I'm currently working in Switzerland at the Fulcher Institute as a postdoctoral researcher. And I came from Argentina, that's my original country. And I am still a permanent researcher there. I'm still in my permanent position. I'm uh, in a lead there. Uh, I'm working for the Laboratorio Argentino de Asesino Planes, which is basically the information laboratory for the future research reactor that we will have in Argentina. So this is uh, my the introduction of myself. I'm currently, uh, as I told you, working as a doctoral researcher, basically um, in a project in which we are analyzing additive manufacturing samples. Um, one material basically the made by gas called gray fusion, and we are using gravity machine and neutral induction technique to characterize this texture. So that's uh, for a small introduction and go straight to the outline of this talk. First of all, I would like to apologize in advance for some of you if the first part of the talk is too basic. I know that uh, texture is not that the, uh, standard uh, thing or is a little bit complicated sometimes. So I will spend a few minutes trying to explain texture or crystallographic texture to you in a in a way that we can all understand what I'm doing. The second part of the talk is basically the neutron transmission and neutron gravity machine technique. And then uh, the core or the idea of the things that I have been working on since the PhD, which is how to go from the orientation distribution function, which is basically a texture, to uh, simulate the transmission signal. And the other way around, which is the thing that we want to do, is how we can, uh, from the transmission signal, trying to infer some um, ideas or trying to get the information about the texture. And uh, I will explain to you two of the models that we have been currently ongoing on this ongoing project. Uh, one is on the Fourier expansion of the idea, and this, the second one, which is the one thing that we have been working on, is a single crystal to polycrystalline approach and some final So we start about crystallographic texture and exactly what it is. With the rapid texture, and I will try to answer these four questions. What is the rapid texture? When it is formed? How it is measured? And why this characterization is important in material science? You have to take into consideration that I'm coming from neutron and from material science. So I will try to explain to you why we want to do it. So what? What is the rapid texture? Uh, from the material science point of view, we have a material, a polycrystalline material, which can be for one of two phases. And it has a particular stratigraphic um, uh, structure, let's say. And if all these crystals or all these unit cells are aligned in the same orientation, we say that we have a single crystal. In the other extreme, if they are completely random, if they have completely random orientation, we say that we have a powder or a random material. And in the middle, we have our texture material, where some of the orientation are more, let's say, preferred than others. But this also can happen that we can have, for example, texture variation, and one part of the sample has one particular orientation, and the other part of the sample has a different orientation. So, how we can describe this, what is a lot of way of doing it? Um, in particular, probably you have seen it. This is an EBSD map with different colors representing different orientations. And we can measure this by trying to describe how many of these crystals, if you have a lot of red crystal, that means that the orientation of this brain is the 001. If you, if you have blue crystal, that means 111. And if you have a greenish crystal, like this, we have a 110. For example, this, this is called orientation map and it's a way to describe the crystal. Sorry? Are yes, they are middle indexes. Yes, so yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, other way of describing this texture is with these pretty figures that probably you have been seen so far. These are called four figures. And I will try to explain to you how we can read these figures because that's the main thing of the whole of my talk. We, we, will, we will see a lot of these figures. So basically, a four figure represents the probability of a specific plane, for example, this one, one, zero, and how this is uh, orientated in the uh, sample reference system. So let's think that we have a, like a sheet here. We have a clear uh, rolling uh, direction, for example, a transversal direction, and a normal direction. 
The normal direction here is at the center of the vertical. And this red color here means that we have a lot of one one o planes pointing in the transversal direction, for example. That's the way that we can read this, right? And these figures are uh, in multiple of random distribution, which means how much probable is to have that crystal there than in a particular random. So that's the way that we describe it. But the Holy Grail, or the, the main information, is not there. It's in a, a three-dimensional function known as the orientation distribution function, which actually describes how many of these crystals in the probe volume possess a given orientation. This is the whole thing that we want to do, is trying to describe how this function looks like in this orientation space. So all the things that I showed you before, as the four figures, are just representation of this three-dimensional space. So the information that I would like to, to, to extract from this is the ODF and not this uh, projection. But we can use this projection. Let's say in this case, we cut this orientation space in different sections and we can plot that in this way. We can also perform this kind of integrals, which are the four figures that I showed you before. Or we can also describe this texture as space of texture component of how one particular crystal are orientated in a product. So these are different ways of just represent the orientation distribution function. Sure. Yeah. Yes. This, way. this is the way, yeah. If you have the, the okay, I have to, to make, explain a little bit. This F is, a, is the OBF, which in this case has three angles, the earlier angles you can, use the representation that you want. But basically, the ball figure is a linear integral in this space. But this angle is a combination. For example, it's this, right? It's a, a this uh, shape, let's say. It's not one of these. But, uh, it's a little bit more complicated how you can, you have to integrate that. But it's basically, you can do it. Yeah, sorry, that's so interesting. Yeah. The gallery is going to one of these curves. Yes. This one? Yes, exactly. Exactly, yes. The, the four here is a two dimensional representation of this three dimensional space, making a uh, uh, integral along this line. Yes. So, how do we have a formula the camera? That depends on the HKL that we are looking for. Yeah, okay. So, it may depend on the HKL, but I also depend on the camera. Exactly. Yes. That's, that's the other formula for that. Yes. I have it. I will show you in a minute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So if it is too basic, but it's short to start. So okay, how we measure this? On well, the standard way of measuring these things is using diffraction technique, Newton diffraction, X-ray diffraction, and the basic the, the basic idea is that if we have a uh, sample placed in a bead, uh, the uh, for example, this, this could be a polychromatic beam or a monochromatic beam, and we have a detector here. We can plot the diffraction pattern like this. But now, if we work in the sample and we have a texture in our sample, the height of this bit will change, the diffraction bit will change. And the, the area or the height of this bit is proportional to the volume fraction of the crystal in that particular orientation. So, while measuring a lot of different orientations, we don't take the sample, for example, in a volumeter and rotate the sample around. We can analyze a lot of different sample orientation. And by picking the height of the different graphics, we can plot these maps. These maps are the experimental for figure, and we can recalculate the OBF from there. That's the idea. Uh, now going to the when, when this is formed. So the texture forms in materials, in particular, during the mechanical processes, and a lot of different materials could, could lead to a particular texture. For example, mechanical information as volume tends to align the crystal along the, the, the direction of the force. Uh, and in particular, for example, for the thick uh, crystal, the 111 component is aligned to that, to that direction. Also, phase transformation, solidification, preferential rainbow, predefinization. So, a lot of different processes could lead to a particular texture. And if we know the manufacturing route, we can assume or we can. Okay. So basically, the manufacturing route could be into a particular texture. And the other way around, if you measure a crystallographic texture, probably I can know how the sample was manufactured. 
Um, and why this is important, or why texture is uh, an important thing to characterize in, in the material? This is because the crystal has a profound effect on the isotropy of physical properties. In particular, we can assume that if you have a random material, uh, we will have an isotropic physical property, but if you have a single crystal, the isotropy will be huge. And this is some particular examples of how the mechanical properties, for example, of the magnetic properties, are completely linked to the crystallographic texture. It's a typical during uh, material, okay, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, um, this is uh, our uh, okay, going back. This is due to the fact that in different orientation, the material is very different, and if you if the texture is not proper, then we have this kind of uh, performance. Okay, so basically, the stylographic texture is completely linked to the mechanical properties, the material properties in general. And if we want to increase or enhance the mechanical properties, okay, <laughs> we can play with this other section. Yeah. Okay. Can I just ask a short sure. question there? Um, so it, it seems that there are different scales here in the, in the top of this, this crystal. Yeah. And then there's some implicit scale, which is like a bunch of crystals, yes. in which you can, it makes sense to say you just do it. Is, is that scale something like it has been worked for the or something like that? Uh, no, but I will explain why. Because uh, this is a general assumption. I mean, we are not just using the terms, right? We can use DBSD, for example. And the scale there is completely different than the terms. So basically, we are assuming that if we, you need to have a distribution. How big your crystal should be, or how small your crystal should be, in order to have this distribution, is something that is not fully clear. Uh, a lot of people use a really small, a really tiny MESD uh, analysis now to say, okay, the texture of my sample is this one. I'm fully in disagree with that because that's not an average sample. So, <laughs> so the other is maybe to say, you have it in the first one, yes. When it takes one, then it will take zero from from the problem of the distribution. And the problem is because we have to put the same organization, not the same thing. Yes, I'm not going to say problem of the distribution, probably in the same distribution. In the case of every point. Yeah, but we can assume the other way. Single crystal can also be represented as an orientation distribution function when you are using just a delta function inside your work. So, in, the, in that sense, the orientation distribution function could be whatever you like. Yeah. Could be a delta it's function a, in your space, or it could be a oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or could be a small, a small yeah. function. Yeah. yeah, so a delta function in the same way, so the rings if you use the associated with the points. Exactly. And that's the extreme next. Exactly. You could also assume that. that um, you know, you've got an average area right through five functions. Okay. I will show you this right. example in a while, but yeah, that's right. the case, right? It's, it's but this is the orientation distribution function like, that I'm using uh, could be whatever you like. Could be this kind of uh, tune yeah. that I showed you before, could be just one single function, could be a completely for any sort of material, it's one all over the place, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So it can be whatever you like in this space. Okay, so and uh, another thing which is also important, and this is also linked to this talk, uh, is how texture impact the capability of actually uh, define residual stresses. Uh, again, uh, when we perform the measurement, we measure the strain, and if we want to go from strain to stress, we need to know the young uh, modulus or the Poisson radio, for example, and these two magnitudes depend on the orientation. So it's hard to say, for example, in complex material as welds, when the texture and the microstructure change a lot uh, across the sample, how it, uh, even the texture can be seen here, A, B, C, and this. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying <laughs> to, to talk fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is where it's important to be certain about the work without actually saying 
<laughs> well, at least it was intermittent before, and I think I'm just completely gone. <laughs> No, no, no problem. So basically, what I'm saying here is if you have a TDR with the texture change locally, it's really hard to predict how they're strained, right? And in wells in particular, this is uh, really important. So, as you can see, these are uh, the link, there's a clear link between the manufacturing group, the crystallographic texture, and the material properties. And in material science, in uh, crystal reputation, it's a really important issue to analyze. Moreover, with the new advantage of energy manufacturing and the complexity that we have in the, the new physics, trying to analyze how the crystal texture change across the sample is really, really important. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and in particular, for this thing, a uh, uh, non destructive uh, technique that can perform this. Uh, uh, texture characterization is really important, and our goal is try to use neutron gravity machine to perform such tasks. Um, so, in order to start really fast of how neutron interactions occur, we all know this, but uh, neutron has been used to study wide range of problems, since from really basic science to uh, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the problems are wide. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll bring, the range is really large, and this is. Basically, due to the uh, impressive properties that the neutron has. Uh, first of all, they have no electric charge, which means that they can interact deeper, they can go deeper into matter, the story next blood from in. Uh, when you can see how neutron interact with matter in red, x ray, in blue, and this is, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there are electrons here in, in yellow. So it's clearly that the, the interaction with matter is completely different with the, with the different groups. And uh, for neutrons, uh, we, we also have the magnetic uh, properties, of, so a spin, so they are sensitive to, to magnetic uh, fields, and we can also add a magnet, magnetism with, with neutrons, but in particular, neutrons have mass, and that's really important. If, and no, 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 they have the right mass, because if we use the relationship between mass and weighting using the, oh, sorry, you know, using the right, um, we can see that the energy are in the motion of the atom and the weight of the energy. Yes, uh, you can it, some that's good thing, and you can see the energy. The interaction itself is due to the fact that we have speed, right? So, uh, if, in order to see how much the polarization is expected to have a polarized coming through, so basically you have uh, spin up, you have your sample here, and you have an analyzer yeah, there to see how. Sorry, yeah, help me. So, you can polarize. Yes. And therefore, if your sample has a magnetic field, this polarization will change depending on the magnetic field that you have in your sample. So is that a structure? Yes, there's an extra component, which is the um, magnetic cross-section, let's say, which is the probability of interaction with the okay. magnetic field. So yeah, the, the, the uh, total cross-section will be also having this contribution. So the Right. Yeah, right. Well, like, there's two things going on. There's when you try to measure magnetic field with Yes. Uh, which is just the neutron just goes in a straight line. And yes. Polarized, polarized yes. Straight line. But we don't, uh, it interacts with, with, them, with the weight. Yeah. And the different 
Exactly. So you can also have uh, new bits in your in your platform due to the magnetic bits, right? So you have a magnetic structure, you will see that that um, you don't require any polarization to do that, right? It's just and your and your case, let's say. So uh yeah, so it means that. Since we also can play with the wavelength and play with the energy of the neutron, we will have a. Thank you so much. Okay. For those on Zoom, we've just switched to an emergency projector. Uh, okay, so we can basically play with the wavelength and we can play with the energy to analyze a wide range of problems with neutrons. And uh, I think you already saw this in in um, Chris talk. Uh, the since the neutrons are interacting with the nucleus, the interaction is completely different than the X-ray. And the probability of interaction which is the uh, attenuation coefficient of neutrons is completely different. And this is the table that I think you already saw. Uh, if, for example, for neutrons, they call the, this is the way that they uh, interact with different uh, isotopes or the different elements. And this is the way that it interacts with X-ray. So it's a clearly different contrast between each other. And this has been used a lot, uh, in particular for neutron radiography and neutron tomography, this different contrast between neutron and X-ray. This is a a standard example when we have a camera, and this is a neutron radiography that we did at PSI like a long time ago. And this is the X ray uh, radiography. And you can clearly see here uh, the different contrast with neutrons. You can see this uh, a more uh, hydrogen and carbon thing, and here you cannot see it with neutrons, right? But this is also useful to analyze a different type of things like hydrogen distribution in metals. And it's been used a lot to predict diffusion coefficient, for example, of how hydrogen is interact with zirconium alloys. And yeah, it's just an example. But another thing which is also interesting is that if we can choose, this is a, a standard transmission experiment. You have the neutron coming through, you have your sample and a detector behind it. And if we can choose the wavelength, we can we start to see some stuff inside your material. This is a well, this is an aluminum well. And this is the radiography with different wavelengths. And you can start see, seeing contrast in different regions, depending on the wavelength that you are using of your neutron. And that's the basic idea of neutron gravity machine. And the technique is basically exactly the same as a radiographic technique, but now we have a pole source, a polychromatic source, basically. We have a collimator here, our sample, and we use now a detector who can actually describe how the how many neutrons of which energy of which wavelength is arriving to the detector? So now our transmission is not just a function of x and y, but also as a function of wavelength. So basically, we are comparing here the intensity collected by the detector with the sample is in the beam when, and with the sample is out of the beam. And if we do that, we can see that the different crystal structure or the different microstructure of our material displays completely different pattern. If we have a single crystal, we have these peaks or these drops. If we have a polycrystal material, but with completely random distribution, we have these brown edges. And if we have a texture material, the edges are completely different now. So clearly, it's a link between the microstructure and the transmission. And the link is inside the attenuation coefficient or the total cross section, depending on the way that you're writing, but it is the same here. So we have to take into consideration, uh, in order to understand these features, that this neutron transmission spectra, we have all the information of the neutron that didn't interact with the sun. Oh, mm -hmm. Go through, right? So in order to understand this, we can start thinking, what are the process that actually remove neutron from the beam? So the beam can be, or the neutrons can be reflected in the crystal plane, can be absorbed by the sample, or can be scattered away due to thermal diffuse scattering, for example. So, right? And if we write this, okay. So 
basically each one of these coefficients I know, yeah, it's, it's really small there, but you can at least see the, the, the expression there. So basically each one of these processes has a particular attenuation coefficient. That's the idea. Don't worry, that, that, that's fine, it's there anyway. So basically the neutrons can be absorbed, can be scattered, or can be reflected in the crystal plane. And in particular, the reflection has a... <laughs> so, <laughs> that's fine, don't worry, that's fine. Okay, so, um, and the, the first two, so the attenuation, the uh, absorption coefficient and the scattering coefficient has a smooth dependence of neutral wavelength. And it's actually a function that we can, uh, we, can um, we can use to calculate how these two contributions will be. But the third component, which is the elastic coherent component, is the one which is linked to the crystal symmetry and microstructure. And that's the one which is related with the neutrons that are reflected on the crystal plane. Exactly this component is the one that we want to simulate, that we want to, to extract information from. So in the standard- Sorry, I missed that part because I was feeling- Yeah, yeah. Um, why does the last one depend on why and not the other two? Okay, so this is just the absorption coefficient, which is linear with wavelength. Uh, That's linear okay. wave. This, this component here is basically the all non-elastic coherent components. They are the um, elastic incoherent component is the inelastic coherent and inelastic incoherent component. These three components are basically thermal components yeah. and they have smooth dependent of wavelength. So, so is it because you're assuming that sample is, is homogeneous apart from the crystal structure? The same material all the way through, so the attenuation doesn't vary? Yeah, but that doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, the homogeneity of your material doesn't matter. I'm, I'm looking how the different components are as, as a function of wavelength. So depending on the wavelength of your neutrons, you will have different type of interaction. But the only interaction which actually depends on the microstructure will be the elastic cross coherent cross section. The other components will be just the same. If you have a single crystal, if you have a texture material, or if you have a polycrystalline material, okay. just depend of the of the alloy that you are using. Okay. So that's the the whole the the, the idea or the takeaway message is that. All these components, we know exactly how to simulate, and they are smooth function of the wavelength. Mm -hmm. the, There's some confusion about what y yeah. means here. Why? Why? Why with the vector thing over it? Yes. And also the Y without the vector thing over it. Yes. It represents one of the coordinates. Yes. And so that mm -hmm. Y that you have there is like a orient orientation. Orientation. Yes, exactly. That depends yeah. on the beam, how the beam is coming through the through your material. The other components are not depending on that. They are completely independent yeah, of the rotation. In those questions, uh, the, the other components depend on the position in the pair. And it shouldn't, because if, the, if, if you have a uniform sample in the sense that uh, your material is the same, not not the crystals, not the crystal way. Same so, atoms, just differently arranged. Exactly, yeah. the same atoms, because the, these two components here depends just of the the type of element that you have in your structure, not the crystal structure okay. itself. But like if you were going to try to do democracy, we have spatially varying structure, but it would still be the same. Exactly. So the only component that you have to take into consideration, that's why I put it in here, is this component. These two, and, it will be the same. And the over vector is the beam direction. Yes. Relative to the sample. Right? Exactly. Yes. Relative to the sample position. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back and try to see how this will look like for a powder. So you have to, as, as I told you before, the component that we want to, to describe is the neutrons that are reflected on the crystal plane. And the only way that they can be reflected on the crystal plane is those bra reflections, right? So basically, we're considering now is all the, the, the neutrons that have been removed from the beam since they have been reflected out due to bra reflections. And that means that they have been reflected out in this device shared cones, similar to a diffraction condition. So for a powder material, the transmission looks like this. This is a, uh, actually a measurement from a copper sample statement. And let's start thinking why this, the, we have this particular shape. So if, if we have a neutron with wavelength larger than the last dragage, 
which means twice the interplanar distance of the 111 plane. In this case, it's a F16 material. There are no possible, uh, the Bragg law is not fulfilled, so no possible Bragg conclusion. If we decrease now the wavelength and we have exactly the wavelength now as twice the interplanar distance, now we have a huge drop in our transmission due to the fact that now the neutrons are removed from the beam due to reflections, right? If we will move forward and now we decrease a little bit more the, the, the wavelength, this device share record starts to open. And now the contribution of the neutrons that are out of the beam are coming from this particular device share record, which is getting bigger and bigger every time that we uh, decrease the wavelength. And if we reach the second braggage or the second uh, beam or the second interplanar distance, and another uh, diffraction cone is now appearing. And again, we have a drop in the transmission due to the neutron that now are removed from the beam due to reflection in a different distance length. The second cone starts to open. The first cone still starts to open. And this goes uh, again and again and again. And then we have a lot of superposition of the different black cones there. That's why these are called black edges, because they have this sharp. Uh, way or the uh, shape, let's say, and each one of these, those are linked to one particular crystal plane. So if we know our crystal structure and our uh, lattice parameter, we can clearly index which plane belongs to which uh, bracket. How did you ask, could you have that formula that just disappeared that had our side yep. in there? Is it that this, what we see is a straight line between yep. Is, is that really arc sign, but it's blown up so much we can't see it's a curve? Uh, no, it's actually uh, this it's straight line. Uh, yeah, I will show you the exact form of it. This is uh, uh, this, will, this was like a long time ago in the forties. Uh, Fermi uh, had exactly function of the powder, so I will show you how this looks like. Yes. But this is basically the idea why we have drag edges, right? Well, we have we have drag edges because neutrons are removed from the beam due to elastic scattering. That's the point. Yeah. So as you can see here, if we if we have a uh, different drag edges and we have no idea about our sample, we can infer the crystal structure that we have. We can also perform crystallographic uh, phase analysis because we can have different crystal in phase there. And by looking at the position of the of these edges, we can uh, also have the information about lattice phasing. If we can measure how these edges change, we can analyze strains as it, it, in, in system rapid reconstruction. But now, if we look how this change when we have texture, by analyzing these changes, we can also have idea about the texture. And that's the whole or the holy grail that we want to do now. Again, why this is happening is because now, instead of having a random material with this device share record, it's completely full. For texture, we will have bots here in our device share record, and it won't be complete, right? So that's the idea why we have this kind of particular shape for texture. Okay, so it's clear now that the transmission signal and the orientation distribution function are linked. And now the point is can we uh, go from one to another? And vice versa. So going in first in the in one direction, if we know our orientation distribution function, so we have full idea of how the texture looks like, we can go back and try to simulate the transmission pattern. This is has uh, this model that I will describe to you now has been uh, developed by Javier Santos Esteban 15 years ago, more or less. And the idea is exactly as as I as I mentioned trying to go for the powder material to the texture material. This is the Fermi expression that I was talking before. So it's, a, it's an analytical expression uh, that depends on the structure factor of our material, the volume of the crystal cell, and the wavelength. This is the elastic projection and how this looks like. And uh, Javier included an extra term here to take into account the texture of our material. And this term here is basically a linear integral in the ball here, yeah, center in the orientation that we want to explore. So if we include this here, we can uh, analyze how the elastic section change for different orientations as a function of wavelength. This expression was used to characterize several materials. Uh, this is a copper specimen measure uh, in this 
three orientations, and you can see in blue the, um, the measure curve, in red the simulated curve, and you can see that the, the picture between course three and ninety. Um, and uh, you can see here in uh, green as well what uh, if, if we measure a powder, how this will look like. So clearly, the texture material is completely different for powder sample. So I think you can one sharp amount. Yep. Yeah, so, so you're doing an integral around the cone? Yeah. For each wavelength, you yep. will have a different radius here because the alpha angle here is basically linked to the wavelength. It's the device you're on. There's another there's another integral there, isn't there, which is rotation about that scattering direction. Yeah, that's yes. I mean you are. Is this one right? I mean, uh, this is wrong. This is beta here. Sorry. So the, the, the integral is around this axis for yeah. each particular alpha. There's also another integral. I don't know. Maybe this is what you're saying, but that's the pole diagram. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the pole figure. Yeah, oh, yeah, the pole diagram. It's another integral. Exactly. I, I, will, yeah. I will show you that. Okay. I mean, this is this is the way that, that Javier wrote it in that time. So basically, from the OBF, you have to plot the pole figure. And at the pole figure, you have to perform this in zero. Okay, so he's already done that one integral to get to that point. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I understand. Exactly, yes. So this is the way that is published, so that's why I, I, I use the same the yeah. same notation, right? Uh, but yeah, there's another integral to go from the OBF to the pole figure mm -hmm. that is not there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And this is a second example for the same thing. This is an aluminum roll plate. And again, you can see that the experimental data and the picture the thing was really nice. So the first attempt to go in the other direction, which means go from the transmission to the orientation distribution function, I did it a long time ago, just using the bracket files. It was uh, during my PhD thesis, and basically what I did was uh, using the transmission pattern measure of different orientation. I used a fitting routine to perform the fitting of the height of the different brackets. Then I created like. A experimental pole figure by using the height of the edges instead of the graphic. And from this, I recalculate the OBF. This worked fine, but if we are missing a lot of information regarding the shape of the edge. I'm just using the height. And this was used to characterize a copper sample, the same sample as I showed you before. You can see, you can clearly see that it's not perfect. The reconstruction, this is uh, the same texture measure by Newton diffraction and gem uh, at ISIS activity. And this is the reconstruction that we do using 70, uh, 57 orientations. It's not bad, but it's not good, you know. Um, and this is the same thing for our aluminum plate. It's beyond worse, but at least the first attempt worked. It was the first time that we did. Um, and moving forward, now, as, as I mentioned, we are using a lot of information such as using the height, and we are take, not taking into account how the shape is changing. So the novel approach we are trying to, to use is trying to have the entire shape of the bracket included in our analysis. And for this, we have two models that we recently have been developing. The first one is the Fourier expansion of the OBF that I will uh, show you right now. And the second model is the single crystal to polycrystalline approach. So this is the whole expression that we have been describing first. This is the integral that we were describing. So this is basically the same thing by reading it in terms of the OBF instead of the OBF. This is the second integral that we are missing. And if we take into consideration how this look like, so we have the dependence of the wavelength and the beam direction here. We have the uh, unit cells, the number of the unit cells, the volume of the unit cell and the structure factor of the different so structure factor. Structure factor is basically uh, how the unit cell contributes to one particular section. So it's the HKL value. And it's the sum, uh, I, I don't have it, I, I didn't really write it there, but it's basically considering the, the elastic of even cross section on the bound pattern. So, so this thing has been puzzling. So, this, so what I have in mind is is that some crystallographic planes, yeah. um, uh, there's not so many atoms, nuclei in the plane, right? So it doesn't give such strong reflection. 
And that's in the structure effect, right? Yeah, structure factor basically means if you have a cell, it's also yeah. how the atoms are aligned there, that will be different for existing structure, VCP or whatever. Yeah. And you have to take into consideration which atoms are in which position. Yeah. That means you change the way that the, the entire cell will affect, right? Okay. And is it known? Yes. You can calculate it? Or yes, I can calculate it from uh, neutral data. For example, for an adult, you can, uh, you can assume that uh, you, every atom in your cell is composed of, uh, of the volume fraction of the, your other one, yeah. right? If it's not, for example, you have, I don't know, um, in a structure which is older, one particular position will be linked to one particular atom and another position will be linked to another atom and that will change your structure factor. So you have to know how your crystal is yeah, okay. You're, yeah. You have to know your material. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry, carry on talking through this. Yeah. yeah, that's why I, I, I would try to explain it in a little bit more detail. So, we also have the reciprocal vector here, which is uh, the sum that we are doing here. And we have the orientation of the vector, which basically goes for the initial wave vector to the final vector. And this is in integrated along all the possible states. And finally, everything is weighed on the object. So what's G, little g? Dg. Little g, little g, what is it? Uh, this is the orientation. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's so three. Exactly, that's the object, and this will, exactly, that will be integrated in the area. And the measure, dg, is, is a measure on, on the rotation. Yes, exactly. Yes. So uh, the first approach that we did to tackle this problem was to expand this function, this OVF, in terms of general hyperbaric harmonic. And this is the expression that we that we work. This is this is our formula here. And using this function, if we include it here, yeah, and we assume that we are in the cinematical and uh, the Mathematical uh, value of diffraction, which means that we have no extinction effect. I must say that because if we have extinction with our data, it's not working. Mm -hmm. uh, and we perform all the summation and all the integrations that we have in this expression, we can rewrite it in a really compact way. So using two different variables. One matrix, which is B, depends only on the waveform and the other part. Depends only on the direction of the measurement. Yeah. So this decoupling is basically the way that we are working at. So what's so PR? Uh, where? In the yellow. Box. Yeah. Yeah. This is the one of the coefficients of the function. I will, I will go back to the second data. So it's a special function. No, no, no. So here, again, we can use this deconvolution. And if we have the texture, yeah. We can simulate perfectly how the experimental data will look. So this is the forward problem. And this is also working for a more complex uh, texture, which is a, which is a an hexagonal material. This is a pressure tool for a nuclear power plant. And the texture here is completely different because it's really sharp in these two points and this one here and nothing around it. And even so, the, the model works really nicely with the experimental data. In particular, I must say, I, I need to go back for a second here to this expression. So basically, the holy grade here is trying to decombiate this term here, which are the Fourier coefficient of the overall. So the idea, or the overall idea, would be trying to fit this coefficient somehow from the experimental data. That's the whole idea of the of the, of the brush. So in order to start with this, um, we decided to start with uh, hexagonal materials. Why? Because it's easier to perform the deconvolution because it's easier to spot the linear independence functions that we need to do. So did you say hexagonal material? Yes, this is an HCP material. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a symphony matrix with HCP structure. And in that case, the uh, volume is smaller. So we do it on close back, right? Exactly. So we require less uh, Fourier coefficient components to describe the material. That, that was why we chose yeah. it yeah. to, to start with. But in particular, we not only use uh, this to perform the entire reconstruction of the OER, we should think about 
how we can extract some particular component from the OBR. That means uh, there are some properties, in particular in, uh, in pressure tools from nuclear power plants, they are known as Kerr factor, and they are basically the way that we can describe a property as a function of the texture. So basically, if we have a property that we want to fit, I don't know, elastic deformation, for example, or whatever, the property of reference would be written as the sum of these two components, and each one of these components represents the amount of crystals pointing out in a particular orientation. And if we attach this particular property and we call the material, this is linked to the four figure that we have here. So basically, we are, we are saying that it's a little bit more complicated than that, but basically, trust me, finally, these two terms here, which are known as care factor, depending only on the Fourier coefficient of the OBF with L equals to two. So they are such as two parameters that we need to keep to calculate this particular uh, this particular parameter. So basically for a standard material, we have a different type of representation, HKL belongs HK minus YL. And this Y is minus H plus K. So we have a way to represent. It's a million index representation. We can go back. Right. Yeah, it's just for example, material. It's yeah. not very really strange generalization of the system. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's just for example, material. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So basically, the only thing that I would like to say here is that in order to represent these particular factors, we need just two coefficients, and that's why we choose them because we want to see if the model is working for just two mm -hmm. coefficients. So we measure the, the 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 sample in two different orientations. One along the this is a tube, so one along the actual direction and one along the transfer direction or hook direction. So we take the sample like this, and we did the inverse problem. So basically, from the original expression, we calculate first the v coefficient. We depend just on the crystal structure. So this is for hexagonal materials all the time. Then I don't have to recalculate it yet. So it's a standard rate. Then we use the experimental data to fit this parameter here. And from this parameter here, we can extract the two coefficients that we want. Basically, we have two particular directions, and we can fit two components of the of the OBM. So I'm just trying to place this bit of a vague question that will kind of distill as I ask it. I'm hoping the the, the Kern's factors are something that only relate to hexagonal material yeah. because they have only certain types of elements, such as the elasticity and thermal properties and whatnot. Yeah. And so, so essentially, there's a texture that which is more complicated. That you're saying there's a whole heap of things that don't matter, and so this is sort of Fitted something which kind of behaves the same, right? Exactly. So basically, in, for hexagonal materials, they are isotropy is so high in the axis, in the hexagonal axis, right? Mm -hmm. So the c-axis is exactly this plane, with the one or o, o, o two. In fact. So the only thing that you want to know is how these axes is aligned in, in your sample. Yep. In particular, in this case, we are. I mean, I, I work for the National Atomic Energy Commission, and this is a, a nuclear material. And in particular, the amount of crystal that you have with the C axis along different orientations will link to how the hydrogen will interact with your sample. And that's a problem, a huge problem in yeah. the material because it breaks your sample. So the whole problem here was trying to analyze the scan factor because this will give us the information of how the hexagonals are aligned. Yeah, and so, so by default, you've got a Something like a fiber texture. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. But you don't care, basically, right? The current factor will average the thing. Right? One would actually be fiber, but it doesn't matter, right? Exactly, yeah. it doesn't matter. But the, the main thing here is that for this particular symmetry, you have just two components that you need. Yeah. And that's perfect because we have only four, two orientations. You don't have to measure tons of orientation for this factor, right? Yeah. Yeah. This will be the same if you want to have, for example, a four old uh, tensor. If you want to have the elastic, I don't know, the young one, yeah. if you want to pick your young models mm -hmm. in a cubic material, the idea is the same, but it's not quite 
exactly the same because in this approach we have no symmetries, we have no symmetry. You need, you need the full orientation. Need, exactly. And we need to know the more orientation. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Can I just ask if you are going to the so the question was so when you say fitting uh, the data, yes. so I guess you are minimizing the distance which so which kind of uh, uh, distance do you think so like this just the yeah, it's a standard difference. In this okay. case, we are using Alice for teaching routine mm -hmm. uh, in MATLAB. Everything is, is programmed in MATLAB so far. Uh, but we have a really powerful texture analysis tool there, which is called Gentech. So I'm using that as a base to start all my, all, all my software. Just these squares. It's a just a these squares. Yes. Of course, this would be improved a lot. But yeah, sure. So we are in the, in the model in part, let's say it's hard for us to. We are trying to link the physical properties of the material, so we are more in that direction. So you said that it fits, don't get an idea of how well it fits? Yes, the fitting is really good. Uh, I don't, I can show you. Is that, that picture? The this red one red here red? is the, the red dots are the experimental data. Right. Yeah, it's actually really good. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things that we have to do. I mean, that you have to take a lot of counts to do that. Yeah, that's the point. I mean, uh, again, this is an experimental mm -hmm. thing. And we have a lot of noise, which is meant to be in an experimental data. Yeah. So a really important key aspect of all this analysis is how far you will go with your in order to cut your different coefficients. Because you start fitting even the noise, yeah. and you don't want to fit it. So there is an experimental oh, so yeah, thing so like to us for exactly, and that's another thing. Yeah, in this material, even though it's said. Uh, the body models are using nuclear industry because they are transparent to neutrons. So if you want to use neutrons to measure that, it's like you, you need to spend a lot of time. <laughs> relate the amount of time that you spend to the data to the error? Yes, yes, exactly. There's a that depends on, not, not just on the on the time, but also in the profile that you have in your instrument, the 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 incident beam, the shape of your instrument. If you have a thermal beam, if you have a cold beam, that will depend. I mean, the point is actually that I mean, it's like an empirical rule for how far the noise is. Uh, yes, you can, you can have an approximation, let's say, but that also depends on your sample, right? If I measure the same time a copper or a zirconium alloy, I will have completely different uh, no, signal to noise radio. Yeah. I'm sorry. So basically, this is just to show you that the inversion model, which is the going from the from the transmission uh, to some of some coefficient. This is the coefficient that we we found uh, from the ODF, and this is from the original ODF how this coefficient, uh, the value of this coefficient. So you can see that the inversion model is working very nicely, and also to calculate these current factors, the the values were really really good. Uh, within the range that we, we were expecting. So the model works. That's it. Um, however, the, the complication of this model is that in order to perform this inversion, we have to have um, linear independence in the set of functions that we want to expand. And the original function would not would be, uh, that, that, and that would depend on the crystal symmetry. For example, a material, this is simple, and we can spot the line of combination and we can eliminate the line of combination. But if we want to do that for a cubic sample, this is completely impossible. So our next step, and this is a paper that we just submitted last week, yeah. we uh written the same thing but in symmetry, yeah. right? So I will show you some, some preliminary results of this. Um so the idea is exactly the same, but now these functions are symmetrized generally. But the idea is exactly that. So now, for a fixed direction, this has some important implication that I would like to highlight. So the first one is that if you have only one direction, it's too, too straight. Sorry, really low. Like, I will go. No, it's fine. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, keep talking. Sorry. No, yeah, but well, I was not expecting to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Got until two. No, no, come on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to go faster. Uh, okay, so there's a, a bit of complication of this expression. The first one is that if you have a fixed direction, all the OBF will give you the same values here, will produce the same transmission. 
And this means that we cannot determine a, a unique set of ODF coefficients just by one. And this is a really important indication. So we have to measure a lot of orientation to do this inversion. That's the first thing. How many will depend on the symmetry of the material? Okay. The second indication is that this function B here should form a linear independent phase. And if we have this now, we can retrieve a unique set of A and therefore a unique set of coefficients. So basically, if we measure several directions, we can extract the uh, unique the ODF coefficient. And the directions have to be not unfortunately chosen. That's the point. You have to know which direction you have. And in problem with that in tomography or construction is that if you have only one axis, you can have a lot of problems. Of course. If you need, I mean, you need a little bit two degrees of freedom, but you, you can also optimize the directions. Of course. Directly. Of course. I mean, that's the idea of the forward problem, right? If you have an idea or a preliminary idea of the sample, not even the yeah. whole texture, but the, the, uh, an idea of the sample, you can choose which are you to be and in order to go back. So that's the main, I mean, this is uh, like a highlight that I would like to so, so can you expand on that a little bit? So you say you yeah. need multiple directions. You'd, yes. I'm, I'm assuming it's three, but I don't know. If I can. That's the number of the critical symmetry, right? You could have the number of index that you have with yeah, the yeah, okay. So it's a bit like we did with the string. You know, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So uh, we did this. This is exactly the same uh, texture that I showed you before, the cover sample. So I, I'm using the same example all the time. But this is the original texture. And if we use uh, the critical structure is cubic, this is an existing structure. But in this case, we are using a specimen symmetry, which is strictly, which means I have no clue how the sample was built. I have no clue how the texture will look. <laughs> This is the texture that we got from uh, from Newton diffraction algebra. However, we can spot here that we have fiber texture. So we rotated the sample in order to have the fiber at the center. And now we can assume that in this view, instead of having a triclinical sample symmetry, this represents an autoromic. And this reduces the number of components that we want to put through. That's the thing that I will have to discuss in this one. So this reduces the number of B that I have to calculate a lot. And therefore, once we calculate that, so we have this now, we got the wrong symmetry, this is the measurement, and now we can fit the A in order to extract this value. And the fitting routine is really good. I don't know if you can see it, but again, in this case, you have uh, the red, uh, sorry, the blue, or it's not F, you can see, but rotting, the fitting routine looks really nice. And now we can extract the A values for different L, just by using five orientation of your Now, in order to extract from this, the Fourier coefficient, we have to invert this, and you can see here how the different coefficient change if we use three clinic sample symmetry or orthogonal samples. So here for three clinic sample symmetry, we can we have only one coefficient so for the first L. But with only five orientation, we can fully describe the orthogonal symmetry at till L8 with five orientation. In order to go to trigenic symmetry, we need to measure 17 orientation in order to achieve the same amount of comfort. And this is that this table is the thing that we can know in advance. So we can simulate how many orientations we will need in order to achieve the thing that we want to do. Not only the amount, but it's also important to know where or which orientation we need to measure. So this is the table that I think we have to do every time that we need to think about this problem. Do you uh, guys know the crystal type that you're looking at? Uh, yeah. You start? Yes, exactly. The crystal structure and the and the lattice that you have is known. Yeah. But, but you're not talking. You're, you're talking the actual. 
texture that you're looking at there, not necessarily the crystal structure. The different fractions should be known because yeah. otherwise you cannot calculate the D, mm -hmm. right? This is in order to calculate this the specimen symmetry. That's right. Yeah. And the specimen symmetry is linked to the way that you manufacture sample. Mm -hmm. So if you roll your sample, you're yeah. exactly. Yeah. So the point is that you can start thinking that you have the green symmetry, which is no symmetry at all. Yeah. And to start over from that, you can decrease the number of components that you require if you have a, a better texture. So in that sense, I think the first thing that I showed you with shut the height is a really important tool to do. Because you can use shut the height to calculate a preliminary texture. That's why you see the height. Sorry, shut the height. You see shut the height. Just the height. Just the, the dragage height. The dragage height. You can create a uh, an inverse copy or a, a, an experimental copy. Or at least part of it anyway. You can calculate the texture and you can use that as we put. And, and if you get it wrong, it won't fit, right? So okay. you well, might you be able to go back to it. Okay, that's kind of iterative method. I think it will be interesting to, to, to go. But yeah, in any case, we, we can discuss it with some. So basically, the only thing that I would like to show you here is that this is the way that the texture look like if I use orthorhombic symmetry. And this is the way that our model is fitting. Clearly, it's not great. And we have some negative values, which is wrong, of course. Uh, um, there's kind of some loss faults, but the main issue here is that we don't have a lot of orientation. We are shot using five orientations, but the model is working, at least the inversion problem is working. Um, yeah, so that's the first model. I will try to go as fast as I can with the second. Oh, uh, what well, we can stop here. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. You are free to roll on. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so that's the first model, and that's based on the on the expansion of the the OBF inferior coefficient. This is the second model. It's based in a different approach. Um, this is based on the way that the single crystal transmission looks like. So if you go back in in time, where I show how the the transmission looks like for different um microstructures, this is a copper monochromator measured at the engine X. And you can see these peaks. Uh, something that is important to highlight is this is uh, plot in one mine the transmission. So instead of drops, we have peaks, but it's the same thing. And this is the way that the absorption coefficient looks like and the scatter coefficient looks like as a function of wavelength. So as you can see, there are clearly no other changes to that small function. So during my PhD, I uh, basically defined a model to 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 uh, calculate or to extract information from this. And the model uh, basically considered that the reflective component or the component which is plastic or given has a collection of peaks, each one with a integrity intensity and shape, which is uh, the peak position, which depending on the peak position and the peak width. And with, using this model, I fitted a lot of samples. But basically, the only thing that I would like to highlight here is that this, this model works when analyzed single crystal material. And this, uh, this model allows you to extract information about that is parameter, crystal orientation, mosaic, and other uh, things. And this has been used to start to study. So most mosaic crystals. Yeah. What is it like to say? If the misalignment, I mean, if you have a single crystal, you can assume that all your planes are exactly aligned yeah. like that. Our that not exactly true, and there's a small misalignment. There are a bit wrinkled within, and within the crystal. We did the same thing. Cool. Yeah, Excuse and this misalignment is clearly it's called mosaic in single crystal analysis. Basically. Uh, and this are, this mosaic is really important. For example, it's a copper monochromator in use in nuclear in, in yeah for nuclear uh, characterization, and the the mosaicity of this is really important to. To, to see how we uh, pick uh, the burden of the object. Okay, so based on that, we keep working on it and we expand the model to oligocrystal material. This oligocrystal material, we have like large grains, but a few tens or hundreds. And in this case, each one of these orientations will represent different peaks and it will measure we will have the contribution of both at the same time. 
So this is the way of my model. The, the new model, uh, we use it to characterize a single crystal uh, nickel-based superalloy. And with this model, we can fit how the different uh, parts of the crystal uh, have different sedimentation. So since we have a, the, the transmission, is uh, especially the salt technique, we can highlight different regions and we can analyze how we change. And you can clearly see that this region here, the peaks are completely in different positions than here. So this is a really important thing to, to, to understand or to highlight. Okay, so based on this, now we want to expand this to a polydistant. So the idea here is that if we if you know exactly how the single crystal looks like, and we can imagine our polydistant material as composed for a collection of single crystals, that's the idea. So basically, in this case, the ODF is defined as a component with a uniform distribution and superimposed to that a relatively symmetrical function with center in different orientation and with a particular width. And the weight of each particular component is linked to the amount of this particular orientation level. And now, in order to go from here, from the ODF to the attenuation coefficient, we know that if we have a uniform portion, which is completely random, we will have the same thing for a power of the material. And we know exactly how this looks like for the equation. And now each one of these components is simulated as a single crystal attenuation coefficient. So each one of these would be written using the single crystal component. Well, this function here depends on the neutron uh, instrument because it has the information about the, uh, not, not just the, the um, uh, instrumental resolution function, but also regarding how, let's say, collimated the beam. Because if the beam is not perfectly collimated and you have a, a, a divergence in the beam, you have to take into consideration that as well. So all this information is contained here. Um, so basically, I'm using, in this case, the lavage of internals which has this particular shape. But the only thing which is important here is that everything could be controlled here just by using a single parameter that controls the weight, the width, the hard width of the full width of a maximum of the function, which is only one parameter. This is how they look like. So you can see this is how they look like for different uh, So using this Delevashi function internet, again, we will have three things to, to define. So first is the width. That we want to use. The second is where we want to center this particular component. And the, the, the third thing is how many of these components we want to have in our sample. How, how many single crystal we need to actually define the whole uh, texture of our material. Of course, these two will depend on the fundamental region and this will change depending on the symmetry. This is how the, the red thing here inside is the fundamental region for a cubic symmetry. And the blue here is the fundamental region for hexagonal material. So clearly, the volume of the fundamental region in different crystal structures is different. Mm -hmm. In this case, we are using the center and the number of components as superimposed in the or in the fundamental region at h square here b, where the resolution or the, the the distance between two adjacent components is linked to the instrumental wavelength resolution. And the number is linked with the uh, volume that we have in the fundamental region. On the other hand, uh, okay, so if, if we have, for example, a cubic crystal symmetry and we use 10 uh, degrees, we will have uh, this amount of orientation, and this is how it looks like in, uh, in the, this box uh, in the orientation space. On the other hand, the parameter B. The tax rate is linked to the uh, width that we want to have. So in this case, this could be fixed in different ways. In our case, we define this parameter again using the uncertainty on the instrument. We have to think that we want to fit experimental data. So nothing is super sharp in experimental data. You need to smooth it away. So in order to do so, we create a powder. If you create a powder using this assumption, 
all the volumes will be exactly the same. So basically, each volume is one divided by the number of components that we have, and this will be a powder map. And we use this powder to calculate how uh, far of these random components are we in order to match the uncertainty of the experimental data. So this is how the uh, error change as a function of the kernel width that we are using. And we try to match this with the error that we are expecting from the experimental data. And that's how we pick the beta parameter for the different experiments. So once we have these three things, we can calculate it. And this is how this looks like. So for a, again, the cubic symmetry, each one of these points will have a particular shape, and it will be for a particular orientation. A second orientation will have a different shape, a third orientation will have a different shape. And each one of those will have a different weight in the orientation distribution function. So basically, if we plot all the possible uh, shapes, this is the way that they look like here. And if we add together, taking into consideration that these weights are linked to the OBF, we have a power model. And that's how we did it. And that, that's where we did it. We use an experimental data in red, and this in black is a simulation of our model using the same uh, value for all the components in the OBF, which is a random material. And we can see here how the same material measure a different uh, uh, instrument, in this case, engine and IMAP, also in a dice facility, have different shapes. And our model completely, uh, completely fall, follow these different shapes due to the fact that we are using as an input the, the instrumental resolution of uh, the instrument. So it's a shape at the bottom of the corner due to the instrument? Exactly. Different here in the tails, let's call it. Of the of the shape of the of the edges adding to the instrumental resolution function. Okay. And this model in particular, if we are using that scheme, it would completely follow that. And the top uh, is pretty much the same. It, it follows the same. I mean, you are basically rounding up. Yeah. Okay. The, the sharp in the side of the thing. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It is the okay. completion. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But the models that I I showed you before, we have no consideration about that. So this is the first model that we are included by definition, the experimental part of the data. Uh, so using this model is a tomographic reconstruction of a, a three fixed linear spectrum. In this case, this is the texture, and we measure the sample like this. So we did a tomographic reconstruction. This is the same data as the strain tomography. Um, Paper, but in that case, we didn't we didn't take in any uh, consideration about the texture. Here we are considering the texture effect. In particular, we didn't use the texture there because the peak was sorry, the edges were really sharp, and the texture does not affect so much the position. Sorry, what, so what are the images on? So this is the ball figure that we measure uh, with Chen diffraction here, here, and these dots here are the directions of these particular blocks. So the dots here are the experimental value. The red curve is the simulated curve that we use in using our model, and the black dotted line is the thing that you're expected for the power. Random texture. Random texture. In this case, you can clearly see here that the number of components is huge, and it will be really impossible to pick all these components in the first place. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Should be you said you did a tomographic reconstruction? We did a, so, a tomographic reconstruction of the strain. Of the strain. Yeah. Okay. And now we are trying to use the same data to reconstruct the texture, but I will show you our problem. Did you know what the strain was? If, did you know the strain? Yeah, I mean, this, so, this was um, 316 uh, uh, last power fusion sample, so it was an additive manufacturing sample, okay. and we did uh, some superficial treatment on top and on the bottom. So we have the two. So I feel the strain. Exactly. So we have the, the as bit sample and we have the case sample, and uh, I can show you the paper if you like. It's uh, kind of the reconstruction of hydrostatic. 
for the shield right yeah. 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 it's not it's not potential because it's from a yeah uh, process I, I think i need to convince myself that it actually is the hydrostatic component yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a shield hydrostatic and then it's maybe but i think it probably is actually the hydrostatic component yeah yeah okay so basically this is another example but it's the same idea it, it works for different textures again the number of components is huge that's the thing that i would like to highlight so in, in this case we have the forward model to take from this we can clearly calculate the transmission but now the problem is from this particular homographic structure this is the same sample that, that we, we measured here. And if we took just the central region of the sample, everything was fine. And this uh, and the central region of the sample is the, the, the thing that I showed you before. However, if we move a little bit the, the, the region of interest and we measure the transmission here, or even in the surface here, the transmission looks completely different. The pattern looks completely different. This means that we have a, a texture gradient in this direction. And this is really tough because if we are performing tomographic reconstruction, how I can be sure that the reconstruction in the edge are not affecting the reconstruction of the center? So this is the problem that I would like to discuss with you about. So how we can achieve this. I mean, we, we can clearly know how to go from this to here. I also have uh, the measurement from the uh, wind with the measurement uh, the wind complement, sorry, with the, the measurement with spatial resolution. So I have texture measured here, here, and here. And I can go in this direction. But it's hard for me to use the entire pattern or or, or it's hard for me to the complete. So that's something I'm going to discuss with you. So I'm finishing, sorry, come out the late. Um, basically, fine marks. The, the idea of the seminar was just trying to show you the current state of my work regarding this topic. I'm really sorry if it was too long and, and too no, it's brilliant. Long because we kept asking questions. And, and, so. I'm really sorry. Uh, I, I hope to. So, make it clear. Let's, let's well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I don't think so. I think it's just my comment saying, saying if you've got any questions, you can ask online. But I know Kyle Fogarty is there, and may, maybe Kyle, if you're in Cambridge, you'd like just to come over this week um, while she's still here. Um, but if anyone wants to unmute and, and ask a question, uh, Genevieve Burke of online as well. Also, sorry, because we are over time, of course. If, if you need to go, this is, you can slow back, it's fine. Yeah, um, but uh, I, I guess we're going to we'll, we'll take any any immediate questions or ones that come from the, the Zoom, the part in chat. Or, I mean, you yeah, sure. Uh, so, like with, with your method where you pick out the like centers, and it, it looks a fair bit like this method in England problems called radial basis functions, but on SO3. Um, and it, uh, the I think you said the location of the centers of the GI yeah. are like on a grid. Yeah. But in that method, actually, they move the location of the centers. Yes. Yeah. So you have a certain number of them, and, and instead of putting them on a grid, you allow the position of the centers to be like a parameter you have to like. I'm working on it. I'm working. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, yeah. I already bought. I mean, I have it. Uh, I have a code for it. I thought this one in my field I currently because I did. Okay. So the problem here is that you have to define the starting point, right? Yeah. In a good way. Because I'm using less for people. Yeah. I'm, I'm using less for people to do it, right? So it's really sensitive to the initial time for the way that I do. But, but of course, I can move the company. Yeah. Matthias has raised his hand. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Florencia, for the talk. It was it was very nice. It was very good. So I had a question. When you describe the, the different uh, coefficients, the mu, the scattering coefficient, the elastic coefficient, if you have a larger sample, do this, how do these things depend on density of the material? Is that yeah. something that you also have to add? Is it easy to add? Yeah, I mean, 
Let me go back a little bit, probably a lot. Let me try. Give me one second that I will go back to the expression originally because mm -hmm. I would like to highlight that I'm doing it. Wait, yeah. Okay, so this is this are the expression, right? So uh, the last the, the transmission depending on the attenuation coefficient, and the attenuation coefficient has two terms. One is the the, the cross section, let's say, and the other one is n depending on density. Okay. So basically, if you know your den the density of your material, you can just use the elastic or the or the cross section, let's say. But if you don't know and this change, you need to use the attenuation coefficient. The basic or the, the main thing is that after the last edge here, here, mm -hmm. the only thing that takes into consideration is that term, which has no dependence on the elastic coherent cross section because no possible bra reflection out there. So the idea is if you want to analyze uh, density differences in your sample, you can use that part first. And, and then and then you can go back and use the entire thing because you will, you will know exactly point by point how that change. This is something that is used a lot to characterize, for example, a uh, defect in, in additive manufacturing samples because you can clearly see changes in the in the density just by using this region of the of the attenuation coefficient or this region of the of the transmission. Yes, but it's like a first step, let's say, in order to the concrete. Right. The different parts. Yes. Thank you. No problem. Can, can I ask another question? So, um, you you um, expanded the uh, in, in terms of um, generalized spherical harmonics on yes. SO3, and then you said if there were symmetries, mm -hmm. then we have a, a subset of, of these sort of independent. So, are you actually using results on which uh, generalized spherical harmonics are invariant? Under the action of the, the symmetry group of the crystal, or do you just calculate that? No, I mean we we preliminary we have a preliminary knowledge, right? right. That's that's the key now. You know the group exactly. Right? But, exactly. But do you have a table that tells you? Uh, you can do it. Yes, actually. What happens when you average over that group? Yes. And you, Okay. That's what that's how we calculate this table that I showed you before. So the amount of components and how what is the best way of doing it, right? Yeah. If you have different symmetries, you will have a different base of function. And that will change the way that you are describing. I'm just connecting to something Paul and I did on um harmonic polynomials in very reaction groups, and it, it just sounded very similar to that. It's just generalized sort of harmonics in SA3 exactly. in very reaction groups. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, we probably have lots, lots of questions. You're here till Friday, right? yes. for, for this visit and back in May. Yes. Um, so um, maybe we leave other questions. Yeah. There. Yeah. 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 We've got lots to talk about. So. Yeah, 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 sure. And um, uh, there wasn't any more questions in, in the chat. Thanks. So online participants who are still there for, for joining in. And yeah. Sorry for the long talk. Oh, no, no. Well, we have the projector, which could be in the picture here, and, uh, and we ask lots of questions, so it's perfectly all right. Thank you for a lovely talk, and thanks for the answer. Thank you so much.